Salam sejahtera and a good day. Welcome to the stress physiology component of the physiology course. Let's take a look at the video shown here. Well, it clearly shows that when life gets tough, you just have to stay calm and eventually you'll be able to figure a way out, just like the rat that has been trapped here. Well, throughout the course of uh, getting stressed or facing tough times, oftentimes animals or human beings alike will be facing a certain degree of stress. But stress is something that we cannot do without because complete freedom from stress is death. Let's look at the overview of environmental physiology. It is actually the study of environmental changes or stressors and how these changes affect physiological functions and responses of an organism. As mentioned earlier, living organisms often have to tolerate and respond to environmental stressors for survival. And sometimes we should not be just be looking basing the looks of an animal to judge whether they are stressed, non-stressed, happy or unhappy. Let's look at this um, cat or named Tadasos or Grumpy Cat. Well, looks can be deceiving. He is perceived as to be grumpy because of his um, looks. And then of course, when you perceive an animal from a human point of view, or humanizing them, sometimes you could be missing out the detailed picture. The cat may not necessarily look unhappy, it's just that it evokes our emotion, perceiving it as unhappy. And this in itself, well, can be something that is actually stressful to the viewer and may not be necessary results in a stress to the cat itself. But of course, the undue attention will surely be a stress for this cat while it is living its uh, fullest, uh, fullest of life. Let's look, a, look again, take a look again at this particular dog. Well, I leave it to you to judge whether this dog is actually happy or is actually stressed. Because depending on circumstances and depending on the pictures, depending on what has been presented to you, the facts may not, the picture may not represent the full facts. Well, why do animals or why do organisms have to tolerate and respond to environmental stress? This is actually a crucial part for survival. Just imagine a camel has to withstand 50 degrees Celsius of heat and tolerate relative humidity of less than 25% in the desert environment. Well, as a result, they have already evolved the ability to lose up to 25% blood volume and yet maintain a normal blood pressure. This is something that cannot be done by other animals because losing huge amounts of blood volume typically will result in hypotension. In fact, other animals can only tolerate up to 12% of blood volume before the loss of blood actually affects or affects the blood pressure adversely. Another example on the, on the other extreme end of temperature will be the Siberian Husky. They have evolved the ability to breathe in extreme temperature as low as minus 45 degrees Celsius. This is something that they must do in order to survive the harsh winter of the Northern Hemisphere. Then again, you also have to look at fish and birds. Well, easy as they are, they may be swimming in the ocean or flying in the sky, in this case birds, well, they must be able to withstand extreme pressure changes. And we know that every elevation of uh, 1,000 meters, there will be changes in terms of atmos atmospheric pressure. So at 4,000 meters, can you can imagine that the atmospheric pressure is only about half at sea levels. Conversely, every increase of 100 meters below sea level will result in 10 times atmospheric pressure. So fish, and birds must evolve the ability to tolerate this kind of uh, extreme environmental changes, something that human beings, something that animals that are adapted to the lowlands cannot adjust. And on top of that, you also need to know that in extremely high altitude area or an extremely deeper part of the ocean, the oxygen content frequently will be less than ideal. And this will be challenges that environmental uh, organisms that are living in this type of environment will have to adapt. 
And then again, there are certain uh, quirky evolutions as well. Birds are also capable of sleeping mid-flight. This is something that is essential because migratory birds typically fly for long distances and long hours without descending to the ground. Just imagine they are flying above uh, they are flying above the vast expanse of ocean and definitely there will not be a place for them to perch and sleep. So therefore, they have already evolved the ability to sleep mid-flight with only one eye or by shutting down one part of the hemisphere. This is actually something that uh, the birds have evolved out of necessity to handle the stresses around the environment. The other one will be the turtles. Turtles have, known, have been known to have a long uh, and to some extent, sometimes a torturous uh, uh, migratory paths. And they may be migrating from warmer seas to colder seas. So as a result, they may endure huge temperature changes. And they evolve it by being to some extent warm-blooded. Okay, Because if they don't do that, they will suffer from coastlands as depicted in the posters taken from National Aquarium, Maryland. Further examples will involve things like uh, organisms like iguanas. Well, this could be related to how owners manage their pets. Well, a pet iguana that has been constantly kept indoors at 26 degrees Celsius or lower and did not have the opportunity to bust in sun will often have at higher risk of suffering from pathology because why it needs to regulate its body temperature at LBTS or lower body temperature set point of 36.4 degrees or higher body temperature set point at 41.3 degrees. This range between LBTS and HBTS is the optimal temperature range for them to regulate their metabolic activity. And of course, basking in the sun also helps them to fulfill the vitamin D needs. So if, let's say, these type of animals are not allowed to bask in the sun or to regulate temperature at these particular ranges, you can imagine what will happen to their skin, what will happen to their skeletal structure and everything else. So oftentimes these are cases that you may see in the front office whereby environmental stressors give rise to pathological conditions as seen in animals just because the handlers fail to appreciate the need for the animal to adapt to the environmental surroundings and environmental conditions. Now, on another note, you may also see that stressors may not come in terms of uh, uh, physical stressors, temperature stressors only. There are also stressors that come in the, in the form of emotional stress or psychological stress, as we call it in human medicine. You can see here an orangutan that is from a free range environment that is suddenly being held captive in a small and barren metal cage for extended period of time, like being in this example for a photograph from Animal Asia. So will definitely result in the emergence of stereotypic behavior. So these are all examples of stressors that and their impacts on the evolutionary route and of course the response of animals. So this brings us to the next part. Why do we need to learn environmental physiology? It is important because it allows us to understand behavioral physiology, habitat management, and animal welfare, particularly when you are dealing with captive wildlife and exotics and domestic pets, as I've already exemplified in the three examples that I already mentioned earlier. In the hot and tropical climate like here in Malaysia, it is also important for us to understand what are the principles that you can approach in order to manage heat stress in animals, particularly in dogs and chickens. In chickens, managing them under hot and humid environment is actually a crucial skill to ensure that their productivity is not compromised in the Malaysian climate. So therefore, that brings us to the next topic, which is actually up the need to optimize productivity strategies through good knowledge of thermal comfort zones. I'll be covering thermal comfort zones in subsequent lectures. Therm thermal comfort zone point to a zone whereby the, the animal can live with minimal stress or they don't have to activate the physiological response to mitigate environmental stresses, thereby leaving more energy, dietary energy for production purposes. For example, production of meal, accumulation of muscles, uh, muscle meats, and wool and so on and so forth. In this case, it becomes important for us to schedule milking time and to look at cooling requirements in the closed house systems, in chickens, and how all these factors regulate or affect egg quality. 
And of course, at the point of harvesting animal carcass, it is also important for us to ensure that these animals are actually slaughtered under conditions whereby there's minimal stress to ensure good meat quality and of course, animal welfare. At the, um, in small animal applications or maybe even in certain exotic wildlife, there are wildlife that have been kept in captive, it is also important for us to understand the need or the strategies that we need to embark when we are managing the behaviors of these animals. And it's also crucial for us to prevent obsessive compulsive disorders that could be arising from pets that has been kept in solitary confinement or in appropriate environments of confine confinement for long periods of time. Well, the OCDs that you may see may comprise of feather plucking, cannibalism, particularly in avian species, excessive aggression and understanding how to control a crowd or a pack in dogs. This is actually an important skill because you need to know that when dogs are in, uh, when the dogs are actually alone, they behave differently when they are actually in the pack. And well, finally, it is also important for us to learn environmental physiology because this will actually allow us to understand the impact of environment on animal physiology. For example, how photoperiod and circadian rhythm affects hormone secretion and ultimately how this affects reproductive efficiencies, cholesterol levels, and the amount of eggs that you are able to get from a flock of chicken. Well, even though stressors are disruptors of animal welfare, we need to know that stressors are relevant to life. And as you can see here, when you talk about stressors, you need to talk about the five freedoms that are allowing animals to be free from these stressors. The five freedom has been covered in your uh, jurisprudence lectures, comprised of freedom from hunger and thirst, freedom from discomfort, freedom from pain, injury, or disease, freedom to express normal behavior, freedom from fear and distress. As you can see, this covers the mitigation strategies to minimize the disruption from physical stressors and environmental stressors, and of course, emotional stressors. And as you can see there in the second column, there will be those interest influencing factors that determine whether the animal can fulfill their freedom from each and any each and every one of these five uh, freedoms that are required uh, uh, for them to, give, to, to live in their environment. And these five freedoms are also specified explicitly in Section 24 of the Animal Welfare Act 2015. So it becomes something that is important as a vet to know. Well, as I mentioned earlier, stress has profound effects on animal production. As you can see here, you may know that, you may recall from your ruminal production lectures that PSE stands for pale, soft and exudative meat that occurs when the meat pH is around 5.2 and DFD or dark firm dry is actually a change that can typically occur in beef and ruminant, other ruminant meats whereby it tells you that the pH will be around 6.2. Both PSE and DFD are stress related. What we need is actually to ensure that animals to be slaughtered under good health welfare conditions, ensuring that not only that uh, they are not stressed at the last leg of the journey in life, but they also provide us with healthy and quality meat with good shelf lives and good nutrition. As you can see here, there are profound effects of stress. In DFD, there will be, well, well there are minimal drip loss. Well, the, 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 the meat will be very, very dark, firm and dry, which is actually not good to a meat texture. Conversely, in PSE, typically happens in uh, pork or uh, pigs under stress, you may get a lot of drip loss that it results in huge economic loss. Just imagine if, let's say, the drip loss is about 10% of the overall meat volume, meat weight. This means that 10% of the meat weight will be rendered uh, a loss because you cannot sell drip loss as part of the meat. As you can see here, this particular bird, okay, this particular parakeet, will actually have issues with uh, OCDs. As you can see here, they are actually do it, performing feather plucking. But you do know as a bird, you need to differentiate this from preening and of course, maybe the physiological, physiological changes to the feather as a result of a molting. And as you can see as well, Psychological changes or behavioral changes may relate to 
Well, certain adverse changes that we see in livestock. Feather packing in hens, well, are known among hens that has been housed in tightly uh, packed battery cages. And of course, barbering or, dom or, or a kind of dominant behavior or boredom is actually something that is very common in rodents that are being kept in captivity for experimental purposes, as you can see here. So before we move on, we have to understand the terminologies of environmental physiology. As I mentioned earlier, we have to remember that total freedom from stress is death. So oftentimes, organisms will have a way to deal with distress. There are three strategies and hence the three terminologies. The first way to adapt to stress will be adaptation. The second way will be acclimatization. And the final, the, 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 the final way will be acclim acclimation. Now, these three terms carry a different connotation in terms of time and response and the magnitude of response. Adaptation occurs over very long periods of time and across many generations, and it is typically non-reversible. Conversely, acclimation, which is actually a very short-term compensatory changes in response to environment disturbance occurring in a laboratory or as a result of your experimental condition. Example will be you put your cat in an air conditioned room. So the cat will have to adjust to the sudden lowering of the environment temperature. Or you put a dog in a very hot car while you are cooling the car down. So they will undergo acclimation. Acclimatization is actually an intermediate time of change in between adaptation and acclimation. Acclimatization is actually short-term compensatory changes in response to environment disturbance occurring within a little lifetime of an animal. Lifetime of an animal, and it could be reversible. Note this difference as compared to adaptation. So in the subsequent lectures, when I talk about adaptation, acclimatization, and acclimation, I hope that you should be able to differentiate the length of response and the magnitude of response between these three terminologies that I shall be using more and more frequently throughout this series of lecture. So when we talk about environmental physiology, we have to talk about stresses. Stresses, as I mentioned earlier, is actually drastic change in environmental conditions that trigger drastic strain to both the physiological and psychological states of the animal. And stressors can be, can be classified into these categories, into these seven categories. The first one will be temperature stressor or heat stress, the, the typical subset associated with temperature stressor. The next one will be nutritional stress, management stress, habitat and climatic stress, psychological stress, physiological stress, and genetic stress. So in the subsequent session, we'll be talking about each and every one of these stressors in detail.